Chapter One of the Moors in Spain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Paul. Chapter One, The Last of the Goats. When the armies of Alexander the Great were trampling upon the ancient empires of the East. One country remained undisturbed and undismayed. The people of Arabia sent no humble embassies to the conqueror. Alexander resolved to bring the contemptuous Arabs to his feet. He was preparing to invade their land when death laid its hands upon him, and the Arabs remained unconquered. This was more than three hundred years before Christ, and even then the Arabs had long been established in independence in their great desert peninsula. For nearly a thousand years more, they continued to dwell there in a strange solitude. The great empire sprang up all around them. The successors of Alexander founded the Syrian kingdom of the Seleucid and the Egyptian dynasty of Ptolemies. Augustus was crowned imperator at Rome. Constantine became the first Christian emperor at Byzantium. The hordes of the barbarians bore down upon the wide-reaching provinces of the Caesars, and still the Arabs remained undisturbed, unexplored, and unsubdued. Their frontier cities might pay homage to Cosroes or Caesar, the legions of Rome might once and again flash across their highland waste, but such impress was faint and transitory, and left the Arabs unmoved. Hemmed in as they were by land ruled by historic dynasties, their desert and their valor ever kept out the invader, and from the days of remote antiquity to the seventh century of the Christian era, hardly anything was known of these secluded people, save that they exist, and that no one attacked them with impunity. Then suddenly a change came over the character of the Arabs. No longer courting seclusion, they came forth before the world, and proceed in good earnest to conquer it. The change had been caused by one man. Mohammed, the Arabian prophet, began to preach the religion of Islam in the beginning of the 7th century, and his doctrine, falling upon a people prone to quick impulses and susceptible of strong impressions, worked a revolution. What he taught was simple enough. He took the old faith of Hebrews, which had its disciples in Arabia, and making such additions and alterations as he thought needful, he preached the worship of one God as new revelation to a nation of idolaters. It is difficult for us in the present time to understand the irresistible impulse which the simple and unemotional creed of Mohammed gave to the whole people of Arabia. But we know that such religious revolutions have been and that there is always a mysterious and potent fascination in the personal influence of a true prophet. Mohammed was so far true that he taught honestly and strenuously what he believed to be the only right faith, and there was enough of sublimity in the creed and of enthusiasm in the prophet and his hearers to produce that wave of overmastering popular feeling which people call fanaticism. The Arabs before the time of Mohammed had been a collection of rival tribes or clans, excelling in the savage virtues of bravery, hospitality, and even chivalry, and devoted to the pursuit of booty. The Prophet turned the Arab tribes for the nuns into the Muslim people, filled them with the fervor of martyrs, and added to the greed of plunder the nobler ambition of bringing all mankind to the knowledge of the truth. Before Mohammed died, he was master of Arabia, and the united tribes who had embraced the Muslim or Mohammedan faith were already spreading over the neighboring lands and subduing the astonished nations. Under his successors, the caliphs, the armies of Muslims over in Persia and Egypt and North Africa as far as the pillars of Hercules, and the Muezzins changed the call to prayer to the faithful over all the land from the river Oxus in Central Asia to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. The Mohammedans, or Saracens, a word which means Easterns, were checked in Asia Minor by the forces of the Greek Emperor, 
and it was not till the 15th century that they at last obtained the long-coveted possession of Constantinople by the valor of the Ottoman Turks. So too, at the opposite extremity of the Mediterranean, it was an officer of the Greek emperor who for a while held the Arab advance in check. The conquerors swept over the province of North Africa and, after a long struggle, reduced the turbulent Berber tribes for a while to submission, till only the fortress of Ceuta held out against them. Like the rest of the southern shore of the Mediterranean, Ceuta belonged to the Greek emperor, but it was so far removed from Constantinople that it was thrown upon the neighboring kingdom of Spain for support, and while still nominally under the authority of the emperor, looked really to the king of Toledo for assistance and protection. It is not likely that all the aid that Spain could have given would have availed against the surging tide of Saracen invasion. But as it happened, there was a quarrel at that time between Julian the governor of Ceuta and Roderick the king of Spain, which opened the doors to the Arabs. Spain was then under the rule of Visigoths, or West Goths, a tribe of barbarians, like many others who overran the provinces of Roman Empire in its decline. The Ostrogoths had occupied Italy, and their kinsmen, the Visigoths, displacing or subduing the Suevi, or Suevians, and other rude German tribes, established themselves in the Roman province of Iberia, Spain, in the 5th century after Christ. They found the country in the same condition of effeminate luxury and degeneracy that had proved the ruin of other parts of the empire. Like many warlike people, the Romans, when their work was accomplished and the world was at their feet, had rested contentedly from their labors and abandoned themselves to the pleasure that wealth and security permit. They were no longer the brave stone men who lived simple lives and left the plowshare to wield the sword when a Scipio or a Caesar summoned them to defend the country or to conquer a continent. In Spain, the richer classes were given over to luxury and sensuality. They lived only for eating and drinking, gambling and all kinds of excitement. The mass of the people were either slaves or what was much the same thing, laborers bound to the soil, who could not be detached from the land they cultivated but passed with it from master to master. Between the rich and the slaves was a middle class of burghers who were perhaps even worse off, for on their shoulders lay all the burdens of supporting the state. They paid the taxes, performed the civil and municipal functions, and supplied the money which the rich squandered upon their luxuries. In a society so demoralized, there was no element of opposition to a resolute invader. The wealthy nobles were too deeply absorbed in their pleasure to be easily roused by rumors of an enemy. Their swords were rusty with being too long laid aside. The slaves felt little interest in change of masters, which could hardly make them more miserable than they already were, and the burghers were discontented with the arrangement of the burdens of the state by which they had to bear most of the cost while they reaped none of the advantages. Out of such men as these, a strong and resolute army could not be formed, and the Goths therefore entered Spain with little trouble. The cities willingly opened their gates, and the deceased civilization of Roman Spain yielded with hardly a blow. The truth was that the road of God had been too well prepared by previous hordes of barbarians, Alans, Vandals, and Suevi, to need much exertion on their own parts. The Romanized Spaniard had fully learned what a barbarian invasion entailed. They had seen their cities burnt, their wives and children carried captives, those few leaders who showed any manly resistance massacred, they had seen the consequence of the barbarian scourge, plague and famine, wasted land, starving inhabitants, and everywhere savage anarchy. They had learned their lessons and meekly admitted the gods. In the beginning of the 8th century, when the Saracens had reached the African shore of the Atlantic and were looking across the Straits of Hercules to the sunny provinces of Andalusia, 
the Goths had been in possession of Spain for more than 200 years. There had been time enough to reform the corrupt conditions of the kingdom and to infuse the fresh vigor of youth, which an old civilization sometimes gains by the introduction of barbarous but masculine races. There were special reasons why the Goths should improve the states of Spain. They were not only bold, strong, and uncorrupted by ease of life, they were Christians and, in their way, very earnest Christians. Spain was but nominally converted at the time of their arrival. Constantine had indeed promulgated Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire, but it had taken very little root in the western provinces. The advent of ignorant but devout race like the Goths might probably arouse a more honest faith in the new religion amid the worn-out paganism of the kingdom, and the Catholic priests were full of hope for the future of their church. The result did not in any way justify the anticipation. The Goths remained devout indeed, but they regarded their act of religion chiefly as reparation for their vices. They compounded for exceptionally bad sins by an added amount of repentance, and then they sinned again without compunction. They were quite as corrupt and immoral as the Roman nobles who had preceded them, and their style of Christianity did not lead them to endeavor to improve the condition of their subject. The serfs were in even more pitiable state than before. Not only were they tied to the land or master, but they could not marry without his consent, and if slaves of neighboring estate intermarried, their children were distributed between the owners of the several properties. The middle classes bore, as in Roman times, the burdens of taxation, and were consequently bankrupt and ruined. The land was still in the hands of the few, and the large estates were indifferently cultivated by a crowd of miserable slaves, whose dreary lives were brightened by no hope of improvement or a dream of release before death. The very clergy who preached about the brotherhood of Christians, now that they had become rich, and owned great estate, joined in the traditional policy, and treated their slaves and serfs as badly as any Roman noble. The rich were sunk in the same slow of sensuality that had proved the ruin of the Romans, and the vices of Christian gods rivaled, if they did not exceed, the polished wickedness of the pagans. King Witiza says the chronicler, anxious to find some reason for the overthrow of the Christians by the Saracens, taught all Spain to sin. Spain indeed knew only too well how to sin before, and Witiza may have been no worse than his predecessors, but the Goths gave a fresh license to the general corruption. The vices of barbarians show open or close resemblance to those of the decayed civilization, and in this instance the change of rulers brought no amelioration of morals. Such was the condition of Spain when the Muslims approached her borders. A corrupt aristocracy divided the land among themselves. The great estates were tilled by a wretched and hopeless race of serfs. The citizen classes were ruined. On the other side of the Straits of Gibraltar were the soldiers of Islam, all hardy warriors, fired with the fervors of new faith, bred to arms from their childhood, simple and rude in their life and eager to plunder the rich land of the infidels. Between two such people there could be no doubt as to the issue of the fight, but to remove the possibility of doubt, treachery came to the aid of the invaders. Witiza had been deposed by Roderick, a prince who seemed to have begun his reign well, but who presently succumbed to the temptation of wealth and power. His selfish, pleasure-loving disposition set fire to the combustible materials that surround him and that needed but a spark to explode and destroy his kingdom. It was then the custom among the princes of the state to send their children to the court, to be trained in whatever appertained to good breeding and polite conduct. Among others, Count Julian, the governor of Ceuta sent his daughter Florinda to Roderick's court at Toledo to be educated among the queen's waiting women. The maiden was very beautiful, and the king, forgetful of his honor, which bound him to protect her as he would his own daughter,
put her to shame. The dishonor was the greater, since Julian's wife was a daughter of Witiza, and the royal blood of the gods has thus been insulted in the person of Florinda. In her distress, the young girl wrote to her father, and summoning a trusty page, bade him, if he hoped for knightly honor or lady's favor, to speed with all haste, night and day, over land and sea, till he placed the letter in Count Julian's hand. Julian had no reason to love King Roderick in his own connection with the deposed and probably murdered King Witiza forbade fellowship with the usurper and his daughter's dishonor fanned his smoldering rancor to a blaze of vengeful fury. He had so far successfully resisted the attacks of the Arabs, but now he resolved no longer to defend the kingdom of his daughter's destroyer. The Saracens should have Spain if they would, and he was ready to show them the way. Full of a passion for revenge, Julian hastened to the court of Roderick, where he so skillfully disguised his mind that the king, who felt some remorse and trust that uh, Florinda had kept her secret, heaped honors upon him, took his counsel in everything related to the defense of the kingdom, and even by his treacherous advice sent the best horses and arms in Spain to the south under Julian's command to be ready against the infidel invaders. Count Julian departed from Toledo in the highest favor of the king, taking his daughter with him. Roderick's parting request was that the count would send him some special kind of hawks, which he needed for hunting. Julian made answer that he would bring him such hawks as he had never in his life seen before, and with his covert hint of the coming of the Arabs, he went back to Ceuta. As soon as he returned, he paid a visit to Musa, the son of Nosair the Arab governor of North Africa, with whom his troops had many times crossed sword, and he told him that the war was now over between them, henceforth they must be friends. Then he filled the ears of the Arab general with the stories of the beauty and richness of Spain, of its rivers and pastures, vines and olives, its splendid cities and palaces, and the treasures of the gold. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, he said, and Musa had only to go over and take it. Julian himself would show him the way and land him the ships. The Arab was cautious general, however. This inviting proposal, he considered, might cover a treacherous ambuscade, so he sent his messengers to his master, the caliph at Damascus, to ask for instructions, and meantime contented himself with sending a small body of five hundred men, on the tariff in 710 to make a raid in Julian's four ships upon the coast of Andalusia. The Arabs had not yet become used to the navigation of the Mediterranean, and Musa was unwilling to expose more than an insignificant part of his army to the perils of the deep. Tariff returned in July, having successfully accomplished his mission. He had landed at a place which still bears his name, Tarifa had plundered Algeciras and seen enough to assure him that Count Julian's tale of the defenseless state of Spain was true and that his own loyalty to the invaders was to be depended upon. Still Musa was not disposed to venture much upon the new conquest. The Caliph of Damascus has enjoined him on no account to risk the whole Muslim army in unknown dangers and had only authorized small foreign expeditions. Still encouraged by Tarif's success, Musa resolved upon a somewhat larger venture. In 711, learning that Roderick was busy in the north of his dominions, where there was a rising of the Basques, Musa dispatched one of his generals, the Moor Tariq, with 7,000 troops, most of whom were also Moors, to make another raid upon Andalusia. The raid carried him further than he expected. Tariq landed at the Lion's Rock, which has ever since borne his name, Gebal Tariq, Gibraltar, and after capturing Cateya, advanced inland. He had not proceeded far when he perceived the whole force of the Goths under Roderick advancing to encounter him. The two armies met on the banks of a little river called by the Saracens the Wadi Beka, near Guadalete, 
which runs into the strait by Cape Trafalgar. The legend runs that some time before this, as King Roderick was seated on his throne in the ancient city of Toledo, two old men entered the audience chamber. They were arrayed in white robes of ancient make, and their girdles were adorned with the signs of zodiac and hung with innumerable keys. Know, O king, said they, that in days of yore, when Hercules had set up his pillars on the ocean strait, he erected a strong tower near to this ancient city of Toledo, and shut up within it a magical spell, secured by a ponderous iron gate with locks of steel, and he ordained that every new king should set a fresh lock to the portal, and foretold war and destruction to him who should seek to unravel the mystery of the tower. Now we and our ancestors have kept the door of the tower from the days of Hercules, even to this hour, and though there have been kings who have sought to discover the secret, their ends has ever been death or sore amazement. None ever penetrate beyond the threshold. Now, O king, we come to beg thee to affix thy lock upon the enchanted tower, as all the kings before thee have done. Whereupon the aged man departed. But Roderick, when he had thought of all they had said, became filled with the burning desire to enter the enchanted tower. And despite the warnings of his bishop and counsellors, who told him again that none had ever entered the tower alive, and that even great Caesar had not dared to attempt the entrance. Nor shall it ever ope, all records say, save to a king the last of all his line. What time his empire totals to decay, and treason digs beneath her fatal mine, and high above impends avenging wrath divine. Despite all admonition, he rode forth one day, accompanied by his cavaliers, and approached the tower. It stood upon a lofty rock, and cliffs and precipices hemmed it in. Its walls of jasper and marble, inlaid in subtle devices, which shone in the rays of the sun. The entrance was through a passage cut in the stone, and was closed by the great iron gate, covered with the rusty locks of all the centuries from the time of Hercules to Witiza. And on either hand stood the aged man who came to the audience hall. All day long did the two old janitors, though foreboding ill, aided by Roderick's gay cavaliers, labor to turn the rusty keys, until when it was near sundown, the gate was undone, and the king and his train advanced to the entrance. The gate swung back, and they entered the hall, on the other side of which, guarding a second door, stood a giant bronze figure of terrible aspect, which wielded a huge mace unceasingly and dealt mighty blows upon the earth around. When Roderick saw this figure, he was dismayed a while, but seeing on his breast the walls, I do my duty. He plucked up courage and conjured it to let him pass in safety, for he meant no sacrilege, but only wished to learn the mystery of the tower. Then the figure stood still, with its mates uplifted, and the king and his followers passed beneath it into the second chamber. They found this encrusted with precious stones, and in its midst was a table, set there by Hercules, and on it a casket with the inscription. In this coffer is the mystery of the tower. The hand of none but the king can open it, but let him beware, for wonderful things will be disclosed to him, which must happen before his death. When the king had opened the coffer, there was nothing in it but a parchment folded between two plates of copper. On it were figured men on horseback, fears of countenance, armed with bows and scimitars, and above them was the motto. Behold, rash man, those who shall hold thee from thy throne and subdue thy kingdom. And as they gazed upon the picture, on a sudden they heard the sound of warfare, and saw, as though in a cloud, that the figure of the strange horseman began to move, and the picture became a vision of war. So, to set Roderick's eye in order spread, Successive pageant filled that mystic scene, showing the fate of battles or they bled, and issue of events that had not been. 
they beheld before them a great field of battle where christians and moors were engaged in a deadly conflict they heard the rush and tramp of steed the blast of trump and clarion the clash of cymbal and the stormy din of a thousand drums there was the flash of sword and maces and battle axes with the whistling of arrows and the hurling of darts and lances the christians quailed before the foe the infidels pressed upon them put them to utter rout the standard of the cross was cast down the banner of spain was trodden underfoot the air resounded with the shouts of triumph with yells of fury and with the groans of dying men amidst the flying squadrons king roderick beheld the crowned warrior whose back was turned toward him but whose armor and device were his own and who was mounted on a white steed that resembled his own war-horse aurelia in the confusion of the fight the warrior was dismounted and was no longer seen to be and aurelia galloped wildly through the field of battle without a rider when the king and his attendants fled dismayed from the enchanted tower the great bronze figure had disappeared two aged janitors lay dead at the entrance and amid various stormy portents of nature the tower burst into a blaze and every stone was consumed and scattered to the winds and it is related that wherever its ashes fell to the earth there was seen a drop of blood the medieval chroniclers both christian and arab delighted to relate portents such as these legend and vision prophecy and sign where wonders wild of arabes combine with gothic imagery of dark shade and we read how both sides of the approaching combat were cheered and dismayed by omens of various kinds the prophet himself is said to have appeared to tarik and to have bidden him of good courage to strike and to conquer and many like fables are related but whatever may have been the dreams and visions of the armies then encamped over against one another near the river guadalete the result of the combat was never doubtful tarik indeed although he had been reinforced with five thousand berbers commanded still by the little army of twelve thousand troops and roderick had six times as many men to his back but the invaders were bold and hardy men used to war and led by a hero the spaniards were a crowd of ill-treated slaves and among their commanders were treacherous nobles the kinsmen of witiza were there obedient to the summons of roderick but they intended to desert to the enemy's side in the midst of battle and win the day for saracens they had no idea that they were betraying spain they thought that the invaders were only in search of booty and that the raid over and booty secured they would go back to africa when the line of itiza would be restored to its ancient seat and thus they lent a hand to the day's work which placed the fairest province of spain for eight centuries under the muslim domination when the moors saw the mighty army that roderick had brought against them and beheld the king in his splendid armor under a magnificent canopy their heart for a moment sank within them but tarik cried aloud men before you is the enemy and the sea is at your back by allah there is no escape for you save in valor and resolution and they plucked up courage and shouted we will follow thee o tarik and rushed after the general into the fray the battle lasted a whole week and prodigies of valor are recorded on both sides roderick rallied his army again and again but the desertion of partisans of witiza turned the fortunes of the field and it became the scene of a disastrous rout the host of don rodrigo was scattered in dismay when lost was the eighth battle no heart no hope had they he when he saw the field was lost and all his hope was flown he turned him from his flying host took his way alone all stained and strewed with dust and blood like to some smouldering brand plucked from the flame Rodrigo showed his sword was in his hand but it was hacked into a sort of dark and purple tin his jeweled mail had many a flaw his helmet many a dint he climbed into a hilltop the highest he could see thence 
all about that wide route his last long look took he he saw his royal banners where they lay drenched and torn he heard the cry of victory the arab's shout of scorn he looked for the brave captains that led the host of spain but all were fled except the dead and who could count the slain wherever his eye could wander all bloody was the plain and while thus he said the tears he shed ran down his cheeks like rain last night i was the king of spain to-day no king am i last night fair castle held my train to-night where shall i lie last night a hundred pages did serve me on the knee to-night not one call my own not one pertains to me o oh, luckless luckless was the hour and cursed was the day when i was born to have the power of this great seniory unhappy me that i should see the sun go down to-night o oh, death why now so slow art thou why fearest thou to smite so runs the old spanish ballad but the fate of roderick had remained a mystery to this day his horse and sandals were found on the river bank the day after the battle but his body was not with them doubtless he was drowned and washed out to the great ocean but the spaniard would not believe this they clothed the dead king with the holy mystery which assuredly did not enfold him when alive they made the last of the gods into a legendary savior like king arthur and believed that he would come again from his resting place in some ocean isle healed of his wounds to lead the christians once more against the infidels in the spanish legend roderick spent the rest of his life in pious acts of penance and was slowly devoured by snakes in punishment for the sins he had committed until at last his crime was washed out the body's pang had spared the spirit's pain and don rodrigo was suffered to depart to the peaceful isle whence his countrymen long awaited his triumphant return End of chapter one Chapter Two of the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wave of Conquest. O oh, Commander of the Faithful, these are not common conquests. They are like the meeting of the nations on the Day of Judgment. Thus wrote Musa, the governor of Africa, to the Caliph Valid, describing the victory of the Guadalete there is little wonder that the saracens stood amazed at the completeness of their triumph leaving the regions of myth with which the spanish chroniclers have surrounded the fall of roderick it is matter of sober history that the victory of the Gadalete gave all spain into the hands of the moors tariq and his twelve thousand berbers had by a single action won the whole peninsula and it needed but ordinary energy and promptness to reduce the feeble resistance which some of the cities still offered the victor lost no time in following up his success in defiance of an order from musa who was bitterly jealous of the unexpected glory which had come to his berber lieutenant and commanded him to advance no further the fortunate general pushed on without delay dividing his forces into three brigades he spread them over the peninsula and reduced city after city with little difficulty mugit one of his officers was dispatched with seven hundred horse to siege cordova lying hid till darkness came on mugit stealthily approached the city a storm of hail which the moslems regarded as a special favor of providence muffled the clatter of their horses hoofs a shepherd pointed out a breach in the walls and here the moors determined to make the assault one of them more active than the rest climbed the fig tree which grew beneath the bridge and thence springing on to the wall flung the end of a long turban to the others and pulled them off after him they instantly surprised the guard and threw open the gates to the main body of the invaders and town was captured with hardly a blow the governor and garrison took refuge in a convent where for three months they were closely beleaguered 
when at length they surrendered cordova was left in the keeping of the jews who had proved themselves staunch allies of the muslims in the campaign and who ever afterwards enjoyed the great consideration at the hands of the conquerors the moors admitted them to their intimacy and until very late times never persecuted them as the gothic priest has done wherever the arms of the saracen penetrated there we shall always find the jews in close pursuit while the arab fought the jew trafficked and when the fighting was over jew and moor and persian joined in that cultivation of learning and philosophy art and science which preeminently distinguished rule of the saracen in the middle ages with the cooperation of the jews and the terror of the spaniard tariq's conquest proceeded apace archidona was occupied without a struggle the inhabitants had all fled to the hills malaga surrendered and elvira near where granada now stands was stormed the mountain passes of murcia was defended by theodemir for some time with great valor and prudence but at last being over persuaded into offering a pitched battle on the plain the christian army was cut to pieces and theodemir escaped with a single page to the city of orihuela there he practised an ingenious deception upon his pursuers having hardly any men left in the city for the youth of murcia had fallen in the field he made the women put on male attire arm themselves with helmets and long rods like lances and bring their hair over their chins as though they were beards then he lined the ramparts with this strange garrison and when the enemy approached in the shade of evening they were disheartened to see the walls so well defended Theodemir then took a flag of truce in his hand and put a herald's tabard on his page, and they too sallied forth to capitulate and were graciously received by the Muslim general, who did not recognize the prince. I come, said Theodemir, on behalf of the commander of this city, to treat for terms of worthy of your magnanimity and of his dignity. You perceive that the city is capable of withstanding a long siege but he is desirous of sparing the lives of his soldiers. Promise that the inhabitants shall be at liberty to depart unmolested with their property, and city will be delivered up to you tomorrow morning without a blow, otherwise we are prepared to fight until not a man be left. The articles of capitulation were then drawn out, and when the Moor had affixed his seal, Theodemir took the pen and wrote his signature, Behold in me, said he, the governor of the city. At the dawn of the day the gates were thrown open, and the Muslims looked to see a great force issuing forth, but beheld merely Theodemir and his page in battered armor, followed by a multitude of old men, women, and children. Where are the soldiers? asked the Moor, that I saw lining the walls last evening. Soldiers have I none answered Theodemir, as to my garrison, behold it before you. With these women did I man my walls, and this page is my herald, guard and retinue. So struck was Moorish general with the boldness and ingenuity of the trick which had been played upon him, that he made Theodemir governor of the province of Murcia, which was ever afterwards known in Arabic as Theodemir's land. Even in these early days, the Moors knew and practiced the principle of true chivalry. They had already won their title to the knightliness, which many centuries later compelled to the victorious Spaniard to address them as Knights of Granada, gentlemen, albeit Moors, caballeros granadinos, aunque moros y hostalgo. Meanwhile, Tariq had pressed on to Toledo, the capital of the court. He was seeking for Gothic nobles. At Cordoba he had looked to meet them, but they had fled. At Toledo, which the Jews delivered into his hands, the nobles were not to be found. They had fled further and taken refuge in the mountains of the Asturias. Traitors like the family of Witiza and Count Julian alone remained, and these were rewarded with the posts of government. 
the rest of the nobility had disappeared. The country was abandoned to the Moors. Spain had become, in fact, a province of vast empire of the Arab caliphs, who held their court at Damascus and swayed an empire that stretched from the mountains of India to the pillars of Hercules. What remained to be done towards the pacification of Spain was effected by Musa, who, when he heard of Tariq's continued career of success, sailed in all haste across the strait, followed by his Arabs, to take his full share of the glory. He crossed in the summer of 712 with 18,000 men, and after reducing Carmona, Seville, and Merida, joined Tariq at Toledo. The meeting between the conqueror and his superior officer was not friendly. Tariq went forth to receive the governor of the West with all honor, but Musa struck him with a whip, overwhelmed him with the reprimand for exceeding his instructions, and declaring that it was impossible to entrust the safety of the Muslims to such rash and impetuous leading, threw him into prison. When this act of jealous tyranny came to the ears of Caliph Walid, he summoned Musa to Damascus and restored Tariq to his command in Spain. Before returning to Syria, Musa had stood upon the Pyrenees and seen a vision of European conquest. His recall interrupted his further advance, but others soon pushed forward. An Arab governor, as early as 719, occupied the southern part of Gaul, called Setimania, with the cities of Carcassonne and Narbonne, and from these centers he began to make raids upon the Burgundy and Aquitania. Ud, Duke of Aquitania, administered a total defeat to the Saracens under the walls of Toulouse in 721, but this only diverted their course more to the west. They sacked Bonn, exacted tribute from Sons, seized Avignon in 730, and made the numerous raid upon the neighboring districts. The new governor of Narbonne, Abdel Rahman, resolved upon the conquest of all Gaul. He had already checked the operations of Ud, who presumed after his victory at Toulouse to carry the war into the Saracens' country, and now he attacked the Tarraconese and boldly invaded Aquitaine, defeated Ud on the bank of the Garonne, captured Bordeaux by assault, and in 732 marched on in triumph toward the Tour, where he had heard of the treasures of the Abbey of St. Martin. Between Poitiers and Tours, he was met by Charles, the son of Pepin, the Aristal, then virtual king of France, for the feeble Merovingian sovereign Lothair had no voice to oppose the will of his powerful mayor of the palace. The Saracens went joyfully to the fight. They expected the second field of Gadelete and looked to see fair France their prey from Calais to Marseille. An issue momentous for Europe was to be decided, and the conflict that ensued has rightly been numbered among the fifteen decisive battles of the world. The questions to be judged by force of arm was whether Europe was to be Christian or Mohammedan, whether the future Notre Dame was to be a church or mosque, perhaps even whether St. Paul's, when it came to be built, should echo the chant of the agonous day or the muttered prayers of Islam. Had not the Saracens be checked at tour, there is no reason to suppose that they would have stopped at the English Channel. But as fate decreed, the tide of Mohammedan invasion had reached its limit, and the ebb was about to set in. Charles and his Franks was no emasculate race like the Romanized Spaniards and Goths. They were at least as hard and valorous as Moors themselves, and their magnificent stature gave them an advantage which could not fail to tell. Six days were spent in partial engagement, and then on the seventh came General Medley. Charles cut through the ranks of the Muslims with irresistible might, dealing right and left such ponderous blows that form that day he was called Charles Martel, Karl of the Hammer. His Frankish followers, inspired by leaders' prowess, bore down upon the Saracens with crushing force, and the whole array of the Muslims broke and fled in utter rout. The spot was long and shuddering known in Andalusia, 
by the name or pavement of martyrs. The danger to Western Europe was averted. So crushing was the disaster that the Moors of Spain never again, during all the centuries that they ruled in the south, attempted to invade France. They retained indeed their hold of Narbonne and the districts bordering the northern slope of the Pyrenees for some time longer, until 797, and even ventured upon foreign raids into Provence, but here their ambition ceased. The Battle of Tours had once for all vindicated the independence of France and set a bound to Muslim conquest, like the swelling tide of the sea, the Saracen horde had poured over the land, and now, through the hammer of the Frank, a voice had spoken. Hitherto shalt thou come and no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. On the other hand, the kings of France were so deeply impressed with the courage of their Muslim neighbors, that though they too delighted in occasional forays, only once did they attempt the subjugation of the Spain. Charlemagne, the second Alexander, could not contemplate with composure the immunity of the Muslim power on the other side of the Pyrenees. As a good Christian, he was pledged to extirpate the infidel, and as an imperial conqueror, the existence of the independent kingdom of Andalusia was hateful to his pride. His opportunity came at last, when the assertion of the first Spanish prince of the Omayyad stock roused the hostility of some of the factions which were always prone to revolt in Spain. Charlemagne was invited to interfere and drive out the usurper. The Spanish chroniclers make Alfonso, king of the Astrias and heir of Pelagius, summon the Frankish emperor to his aid, but there is more reason to believe that the invitation came from certain disappointed Muslim chiefs, who could not brook the authority of Abdel Rahman, the Umayyad, and who were ready to submit even to the sworn enemy of Islam, rather than recognize the new ruler. The moment of the appeal was propitious. Charlemagne had just completed, as he thought, the subjugation of the Saxons. Their chief, Vitekind, had been banished, and thousands of his followers were coming to Padovan to be baptized. The conqueror's hands were thus free to turn to other schemes of victory. It was arranged that he should invade Spain, while the factious Muslim chiefs should make diversions in his favor at three different points. Fortunately for the new-founded dynasty of Cordoba, this formidable coalition came to naught. The allies in Spain miscalculated their time and fell to blows with one another and when Charlemagne crossed the Pyrenees in 777, he found himself unsupported. He began the siege of Zaragoza, when the news was brought him that Wittekind had returned and raised the Saxons, who were again in arms, and had advanced as far as Cologne. There was nothing for it but to hurry back and defend his dominions. He rapidly retraced his steps, and main part of his army had already crossed the mountains when disaster overtook the rear in the pass of Roncesvalles. The Basques, who nourished an eternal hatred against the Franks, had laid a skillful ambuscade among the rocky defiles of the Pyrenees, and allowing the advanced part of the army to march through, waited till the rear guard, encumbered with baggage, began slowly to dread its way through the pass. Then they fell upon it hip and thigh, so that scarcely a Frank escaped. The Christian chroniclers tell terrible tales of the slaughter done that day. According to them, it was the Saracens, side by side with the Knights of Leon, who wrought this havoc upon the King Charles. We read in the old Spanish ballad how the legendary hero of Bernardo del Capio led the chivalry of Leon to the massacre of the Frankish host. With three thousand men of Leon from the city Bernard goes to protect the soiled Hispanian from the spears of Frankish foes, from the city which is planted in the midst between the seas, to preserve the name and glory of old Belial's victories. Free were we born, this does they cry, though to our king we owe the homage and fealty behind his crest to go. 
By God's behest our aid he shares, but God did never command that we should leave our children heirs of an enslaved land. Our breasts are not so timorous, nor our arms so weak, nor our veins so bloodless, that we our vow should break to sell our freedom for fear of prince or paladin. At least we sell our birthright dear, no bloodless price they will win. At least King Charles, if God decrees he must be lord of Spain, shall witness that the Leonis were not aroused in vain. He shall bear witness that we died as we lived our sires of old, nor only of Numancium's pride shall minstrel's tale be told. The lion that had bathed his paws in seas of Libyan gore, shall he not battle for the laws and liberties of yore? Anointed cravens may give gold to whom it likes them well, but steadfast heart and spirit, Alfonso never shall quell. Side by side with the doughty warriors of Leon, who thus refused to join the prince of the Astrias in his homage to Charlemagne, were, according to the romances, a host of valiant Saracens who joined in the onset upon the retiring Franks. Pseudo Turpin's legendary history of Charles and Orlando tells of a fresh body of 30,000 Saracens who now poured furiously down upon the Christians, already faint and exhausted with fighting so long, and smote them from high to low, so that scarcely one escaped. Some were transpierced with lances, some killed with clubs, others beheaded, burnt, flayed alive, or suspended on trees. The massacre was horrible, and the memory of that day has never faded from the imagination of the peasantry of the district. When the English army pursued Napoleon's marshals through the pass of Roncesvalles, the soldiers heard the people singing the old ballad of the fatal field, and Spanish minstrels have recorded many incidents through our force of the fight. One of the most famous is the ballad of Admiral Guarinos, which Don Quixote and Sancho Panza heard sung at Toboso, according to the veracious history of Cervantes. The day of Roncesvalles was dismal day for you. Yea, men of France, for there the lance of King Charles was broken in two. Yea, well may curse that rueful field, for many a noble peer, in fray or fight, the dust did bite beneath the Bernardo's spear. Their captured was Guarinos, King Charles's admiral. Seven Moorish kings surrounded him and seized him for their thrall. And the ballad goes on to tell the tale of Guarino's captivity and of his revenge at Tourny, when he slew his captor and rode free for France. Among the slain that day was a Roland, the redoubtable paladin, commander of the frontier of Brittany. He is the sole Lancelot of Charlemagne romance, and many are the doughty deeds recorded of him. He had fought all day in the thickest of the fray, dealing deadly blows with his good sword Durenda but all his prowess could not save the day. So, wounded to death and surrounded by the bodies of his friends, he stretched himself on the ground and prepared to yield up his soul. But first he drew his faithful sword, then which he would sooner have spared the arm that wielded it, and saying, O sword of unparalleled brightness, excellent dimensions, admirable temper, and hilt of the whitest ivory, decorated with a splendid cross of gold, topped by a bell-line apple, engraved with the sacred name of God, endued with keenness and every other virtue. Who now shall wield thee in battle? Who shall call thee master? He that possessed thee was never conquered, never daunted by the foe. Phantoms never appalled him. Aided by the Almighty, with thee he destroyed the Saracen, Exalt the faith of Christ, and win consummate glory. O happy sword, keenest of the kin, never was one like thee. He that made thee, made not thy fellow. No one escaped with life from thy stroke. And lest Durenda should fall into the hands of a craven or an infidel, Roland smote it upon a block of stone and break it in twain. Then he blew his horn, which was so resonant, that all other horns were split by its sound, and now he blew it with all his might, till the veins of his neck burst, and the blast of that dread horn, 
on Font Arabian echoes borne, reached even to King Charles' ear as he lay encamped and ignorant of the disaster that had befallen the rear guard eight miles away. The king would have hastened to answer the fallen blast that seemed to tell of a tragedy, but a traitor told him that Roland was gone a hunting, and Charlemagne was persuaded not to answer the summons of his faithful paladin, who, after prayer and confession, gave up the ghost. Then Baldwin, another of the peers of France, came running to the king and told him of what had befallen the rear of his army and the death of Roland and Oliver. Whereupon the king and all his army turned and marched back to Roncesvalles, where the ground was strewn with death, and Charles himself was the first to descry the body of a hero, lying in the form of a cross, with his horn and broken sword beside him. Then did great Charles lament over him with bitter sighs and sobs, wringing his hands and tearing his beard, and crying, O right arm of thy sovereign's body, honor of the Franks, sword of justice, inflexible spear, inviolable breastplate, shield of safety, noble defender of the Christians, scourge of the Saracens, a wall to the clergy, the widows and orphans' friends, and just and faithful in judgment, renowned count of the Franks, valiant captain of our armies, why did I leave thee here to perish? How can I behold thee dead, and not die with thee? Why hast thou left me sorrowful and alone, a poor miserable king? But thou art exalted to the kingdom of heaven, and dost enjoy the company of angels and martyrs. Thus did Charles mourn for Roland to the last day of his life. On the spot where he died, the army rested, and the body was embalmed with balsam, aloes, and myrrh. The whole army of the Franks watched by it that night, honoring the cause with hymns and songs, and lighting fires on the mountains round about. Then they took him with them, and buried him right royally. Thus ended the fatal day, when Roland Brave and Oliver, and every paladin and peer, on Roncesvalles died. No action of so small importance has ever been made the theme of so many heroic legends and songs. It is the Thermopylae of Pyrenees, with none of the glory or significance, but all the glamour of its prototype. End of chapter 2Chapter Three of the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The People of Andalusia. The victory of Charles Martel in 733 had set a bound to the Saracens' invasion of Europe. They no longer thought of further conquest, but turned to the work of consolidating the kingdom they had acquired. After the brief and disastrous incursion of Charlemagne, they were left in almost undisturbed possession of their new territory for a period of three hundred years. It is true the descendants of the expelled Goths still held out in the stubborn independence in the mountainous district of the north, and from time to time recovered a portion of their ancient dominion, but these inroads, while they gave some trouble, did not materially endanger the domination of the Moors over the greater part of Spain until the 11th century. The conquerors accepted the independence of the northern provinces as an inevitable evil, which would cost more blood to remove than the feat was worth, and leaving Galicia, Leon, Castile, and the Biscayan provinces to the Christians, they contented themselves with the better part of the land, the Christians might enjoy the dreary waste and the rocky defiles of the north, provided they did not interfere with the Moors' enjoyment of the warm and fertile provinces of the south and east. From the end of the 8th century, when the Moorish boundaries took a tolerably final shape, to the time of the advance of the Christian kingdoms in the 11th century, the division between the Christian north and the Muslim south may be lawfully placed at the great range of the mountains called the Sierra de Guadarrama, which runs in a northeasterly direction from Coimbra in Portugal to Zaragoza, from whence the Ebro may be taken as a rough boundary. 
The Moors thus enjoyed the fertile valleys of the Tagus, the Guadiana, the Guadalquivir, the very name of which bears witness to its Arab owners, for Guadalquivir is a corruption of the Arabic Wadil Kebir, or the Great River, besides possessing the famous cities of Andalusia, the wealth and commerce and climatic advantage of which had been celebrated from Roman times. The division was a natural one. The two parts have been distinguished geographically from time immemorial on account of their climatic differences. The north is bleak and exposed to the biting winds, subject to heavy rains and intense cold. A good pasturage country, but in most parts ill to cultivate. The south, while tormented by the hot winds that blow over from Africa, is genial, well watered and capable of high cultivation. A great plateau divides the two, and though this fell chiefly on the Moorish side, it was to some extent debatable land and insecurely held. Its chilly heights rendered it distasteful to lovers of sunshine like the Moors, and they confided chiefly to the care of the Berber tribes who had first come over with Tariq and who were always held in poor estimation by the true Arabs who reaped the fruits of the conquest. In the two-thirds of the peninsula thus marked up by nature for their habitation, which the Arabs always called Andalus, and we shall call Andalusia, to distinguish it from the entire peninsula, the Moors organized that wonderful kingdom of Cordoba, which was the marvel of the Middle Ages, and which, when all Europe was plunged in barbaric ignorance and strife, alone held the torch of learning and civilization, bright and shining before the Western world. It must not be supposed that the Moors, like the barbarian hordes who preceded them, brought desolation and tyranny in their wake. On the contrary, never was Andalusia so mildly, justly, and wisely governed as by her Arab conquerors. Where they got their talent for administration, it is hard to say, for they came almost direct from the Arabian desert, and the rapid tide of the victories had left them little leisure to acquire the art of managing foreign nations. Some of their counselors were Greeks and Spaniards, but this does not explain the problem, for these same counselors were unable to produce similar results elsewhere, and all the administrative talents of Spain had not sufficed to make the Gothic domination tolerable to its subject. Under the Moors, on the other hand, the people were on the whole contented, as contented as any people can be whose rulers are of a separate race and creed, and far better pleased than they had been when their sovereigns belonged to the same religion as that which they nominally professed. Religion was indeed the smallest difficulty which the Moors had to contend with at the outset, though it became troublesome afterwards. The Spaniards were as much pagan as Christian. The new creed promulgated by Constantine had made little impression among the general mass of population who were still predominantly Roman. What they wanted was not a creed, but the power to live their lives in peace and prosperity. This their Moorish masters gave them. At first, of course, there was a brief period of confusion, some burning, pillaging, massacring, but this was soon checked by the Arab governors. When things had settled down again, the subject population found themselves at least no worse off than before, and they shortly began to perceive that they had benefited by the change of rulers. They were permitted to retain their own laws and judges, governors of their own race administered the district, collected the taxes, and determined such differences as arose among themselves. The citizen classes, instead of bearing the whole burden of state expenditure, had only to pay a poll tax of no very exacting amount, and they were free of all obligations unless they held cultivable land, in which case they paid the karaj, or land tax as well. The poll tax was graduated according to the rank of the payer from 12 to 48 dirhams a year, or from about 3 to 12 pounds at our present purchasing power of money. 
and his collection in twelve monthly installments made it easier to meet. The poll tax was an imposed upon heresy. It was levied only upon Christians and Jews. The land tax, on the other hand, which varied according to the productiveness of the soil, was assessed equally on Christians, Jews, and Muslims. As a rule, the old proprietors and cities preserved their property as before the conquest. The lands of the church, indeed, and of those landowners who had fled to the mountains of the north, were confiscated, but even then their serfs were left upon them as cultivators and were only required to pay a certain proportion, varying from a third to four-fifths of the produce, to their new Muslim lord. Sometimes the cities, such as Merida and Orihuela, had been able to obtain exceptionally favorable terms from the conquerors and were suffered to retain their goods and lands upon payment of a fixed tribute. At the worst, beyond the poll tax, the Christians were in no way subject to heavier exactions than their Muslim neighbors. They had even gained a right which had never been permitted them by the Gothic kings. They could alienate their lands. In a religious toleration, they have nothing to regret. Instead of persecuting them and forcing upon them a compulsory conversion, as Goth had upon the Jews, the Arabs left them free to worship whom or what they pleased, and so valuable was the poll tax to the treasury that the sultans of Cordoba were much more disposed to discourage than to welcome any considerable missionary fervor that might deprive the state of so useful a source of revenue. The result was that the Christians were satisfied with the new regime and openly admitted that they preferred the rules of the Moors to that of the Franks or Goths. Even their priests, who had lost most of all, were at first but little incensed with the change, as the old chronicle, ascribed to Isdore of Beja, written at Cordoba in 754, shows. The good monk is not even scandalized at so unholy an alliance as the marriage between Roderick's widow and the son of Musa. But the best proof of the satisfaction of the Christians with their new rulers is the fact that there was not a single religious revolt during the 8th century. Above all, the slaves who had been cruelly ill-used by the Goths and Romans had cause to congratulate themselves upon the change. Slavery is a very mild and humane institution in the hands of a good Mohammedan. The Arabian prophet, while unable to do away with an ancient institution, which was nevertheless repugnant to the socialistic principles of Islam, did his utmost to soften the rigors of slavery. God, said he, had ordained that your brothers should be your slaves. Therefore him whom God had ordained to be the slaves of his brother, his brother must give him of the food which he ate himself, and of the clothes wherewith he clothed himself, and not order him to do anything beyond his power. A man who ill-treats his slaves will not enter into paradise. There is no more commendable action in Mohammedan morals than to free slaves, and such enfranchisement is enjoined by the prophet, especially as an atonement for an undeserved blow or other injustice. In Andalusia, the slaves upon the estates that had passed from the Christians into the possession of Muslims were almost in the position of small farmers. Their Mohammedan masters, whose trade was war and who despised heartily such a manual occupations as tilling the soil, left them free to cultivate the land as they pleased, and only insisted on a fair return of the products. Slaves of Christians, instead of being hopelessly condemned to servitude for all their lives, were now provided with the simplest possible road to freedom. They had only to go to the nearest Mohammedan of repute and repeat the formula of belief, that is, no God but God, and Mohammed is his prophet, and they became immediately free. Conversion to Islam does carry it with it enfranchisement, and it is no wonder that we find the Spanish slaves hastening to profess the new faith and thus to become free men. 
the catholic priests had taken small pains to graft their christian religion into their hearts they had enough to do to look after their estates and the souls of the nobles without troubling themselves about the spiritual wants of the ignorant and the change from semi-pagan semi-christian vacuity to a perhaps equally unintelligent apprehension of islam was no very severe wrench to the servile mind nor were the slaves by any means the only converts to the new religion many of the large proprietors and men of position became mohammedans either to avoid the poll tax or to preserve their estates or because they honestly admired the simple grandeur of this latest presentment of theism these converts or renegades were destined to cause some trouble in the states as will presently be seen while admitted to the equality involved in conversion they were not really allowed to equal rights and privileges they were excluded from the office of states and regarded with suspicion by the muslims de la vie roche as interested converts people who would sell their souls for pelf in the end these distinctions died out but not before they had produced serious dissensions and even insurrections as far as the vanquished were concerned we have seen that the conquest of andalusia by the arabs was on the whole a benefit it did away with the overgrown estate of the great nobles and churchmen and converted them into small proprietorships it removed the heavy burdens of the middle classes and restricted the taxation to the test tax per poll levied on unbelievers and the land tax levied equally on muslim and christian and it induced a widespread emancipation of the slaves and a radical improvement in the conditions of the unemancipated who now became almost independent farmers in the service of their non-agricultural mohammedan masters it was otherwise with the victors there is no greater mistake than to imagine that the arabs who spread with such astonishing rapidity over half the civilized world were in any real sense a united people so far was this from being the truth that it demanded all mohammed's diplomatic skill and all his marvelous personal prestige to keep up semblance of unity even while he was alive the arabs were made of a number of hostile tribes or clans many of whom had been engaged in deadly blood feud for several generations and all of whom were moved by a spirit of trivial jealousy which was never entirely extinguished had the newly founded mohammedan state been restrained within the borders of arabia there can be no doubt that it would speedily have collapsed in the rivalry of the several clans as it was the death of prophet was followed by a general rising of the tribes islam became a permanent and worldwide religion only when it clothed itself with armor and became a church militant the career of conquest saved the faith the arabs laid aside for a while their internecine jealousies to join together in a grand chase for booty there was of course a strong fanatical element in the enthusiasm of conquest they fought partly because they were contending with the enemies of god and his prophet because a martyr's benjamin's cup of happiness awaited those who fell in the path of god as they termed the religious war but there is no denying that the riches of caesars and Cosros, the fertile lands and prosperous cities of uh, neighboring kingdoms formed a very large element in the muslims zeal for the spread of the faith as soon as the career of conquest was exchanged for the quiet of settled possession the various jealousies and dissensions which the tumult and profits of invasion had kept to some degree in abeyance broke forth into dangerous activity the party spirit of the arab tribes extended to all parts of the vast empire they had subdued and influenced even the caliph at damascus the nomination of the governors of the most distant provinces were actuated by mere factious motives in spain where the emir of andalus as he was styled was appointed either by the governor of africa or by the caliph of damascus himself 
these party differences worked havoc with the peace and order of the kingdom during the first fifty years of Moorish rule. Governors were appointed, deposed, or murdered in deference to the mandates of some faction, who resented the government being entrusted to a man of Medina faction, or would not have a clansman of Kais, or objected to the nomination of a member of Yemen party and throughout the history of the domination of moors in spain this baleful influence continued to work injury to the state in andalusia moreover there was another and very important party to be reckoned with besides the various arab factions the conquest of the peninsula had been effected almost entirely by tariq and his berbers and these berbers who are the Moors proper, though the word is conveniently employed to denote the mixture of Arabs and Berbers, form the leading factor in the new state of things. They were not an effete nation like the Romanized Spaniard, but a people full of life and martial energy. In their mountain fastness and ranging the plains from Egypt to the Atlantic, in their numerous and widely distinguished clans, the Berbers had offered to the Arabs much more formidable resistance than the trained soldiers of Persia or Rome. In many ways they resembled their invaders. They were clansmen like the Arabs. Their political ideas were democratic like theirs, with the same reverence for noble families, which took away the dangerous qualities of pure democracy among an ignorant people. Their very manner of warfare was almost Arab. For seventy years, the two races of nomads fought together, and when at last the Arabs obtained the upper hand, it was rather by the acquiescence of their force than by any distinct submission. The Berbers permitted the Arab governor to hold his court near the coast, but insist on preserving their own tribal government among themselves, and demanded to be treated as brothers, not as servants, by their antagonists. This fraternal system worked fairly well for a time. The Berbers, always a marvelously credulous people, were quick to accept any new faith, and embraced Islam with a fervor far exceeding anything the more skeptical minds of the Arabs could evoke. Very soon, Barbary became the hotbed of religious nonconformity. The arid doctrine of Islam was supplemented by those more mystical and emotional elements which imaginative minds soon engraft upon any creed soever, and the Mohammedan dissenter, expelled from the more rigid regions of orthodoxy, found a singularly productive soil for his doctrines in the simple minds of the Berbers. The same susceptibility to religious emotion which had produced so general conversion that the conquest of Spain was effected by a Berber general and 12,000 Berber troops soon led to further movements. The Marabouts, saint, missionary or priest, came to exercise a more potent influence over these credulous people than tribal chief or Arab governor could ever acquire. It needed but a few mock miracles to bring a host of gaping devotees about the shrine of the Marabout, and so clearly had an Arab general realized this condition of popularity that when he perceived the influence which a priestess exercised over the people by her jugglery, the subtle Muslims set to work in the same manner and soon became an adept at legerdemain or whatever corresponded to spirit rapping in those days with the very best results. But a people so easily influenced by such means a priest-ridden nation is always liable to a sudden and violent revolutions, which its priest can stimulate by a single word. The Marabouts among the Berbers were responsible for most of the later changes that took place in North Africa. They set up the Fatimites, sent the Almoravides victorious through Barbary and Spain, and then put them down by the Almohades. They began very early to work against the Arab governors, and when one of these had indulged his passion for luxury at the expense of a cruel oppression of his subject, the priest set the Berbers in revolt, and in a moment the whole of the western half of the Mediterranean coast were up in arms, 
and the Arabs were terribly defeated. 30,000 fresh troops were sent from Syria to recover the provinces, but these, joined to the Arabs that still remained in Africa, were repulsed with great slaughter, and the remnant was cooped up in Ceuta, where they daily awaited famine and massacre. The Berbers in Andalusia, always in intimate touch with their kinsmen over the water, were quick to feel the influence of such a revolution as was then, 741, going forward in Africa. They had cause to grudge the Arabs their lion's share of the spoils of Spain, which had been the trophies of the Berbers' bow and spear, while the Arabs, who had only arrived in time to reap the advantage of the conquest, had appropriated all the most smiling provinces of the peninsula, the Berbers found themselves relegated to the most unlovely parts, to the dusty plains of Estremadura, or to the ice mountains of Leon, where they had to contend with the climate which severely tried nature's brought up in African heats, and where, too, they had the doubtful privilege of forming a buffer between their Arab allies and the Christians of the north. Already there had been signs of disaffection. One of the Taik's Berber generals, Monosa, who had married the daughter of Ud, Duke of Aquitaine, raised the standard of revolt when he heard the oppression of his countrymen in Africa, and now, when the Berber cause was triumphant across the strait, a general rising took place among the northern provinces. The Berbers of the borders of Galicia, of Merida, Korea, and all the region round about, took up arms and began to march south upon Toledo, Cordoba, and Algeciras, whence they intend to take ship and go to join their compatriots in Barbary. The situation was full of peril, and the Arab emir of Andalusia, Abdel Malik, who had sternly refused to lend any assistance to the Syrian Arabs shut up in Ceuta, now found himself in this dilemma that either he must submit to his own rebellious Berbers, or he must invite the cooperation of the very Syrians whom he had persistently refused to succor, and who, when they arrived, might possibly turn out to be a worse plague than that they came to remove. In grave apprehension, he sent ships and brought over the Syrians, after first making them promise to go back when their work was done. Thus reinforced, the Arabs of Andalusia put the Berbers to utter rout, hunted them like wild beasts through the country to their mountain fastness, and gratified their vengeance to the full. And then, the event which Abdel Malik had endeavored to guard against came to pass. The Syrian auxiliaries refused to exchange the rich land of Andalusia for the desert of Africa and the spear of the triumphant Berbers. They defied and murdered Abdel Malik and set up their own chief in his stead. The result was a long and obstinate struggle between the old Arab party and the newcomers accompanied by much bloodshed and devastation. The struggle was only decided when the Caliph of Damascus sent over a new and able governor, who divided the hostile factions by giving them settlements in cities far apart from each other, and banished the more turbulent of their leaders. Thus the Egyptian contingent of the Syrian army was settled in Murcia, which they rechristened Misr or Egypt, the men of Palestine at Sidonia and Algeciras, the people of the Jordan at Reggio, Malaga, those of Damascus in Elvira, Granada, and the battalion of Kinesrin at Jaén. From this time, one of the causes of faction in Andalusia was removed, but party spirits still ran high, and government was often changed to anarchy until a ruler armed with a peculiar prestige carrying in his person the authority and blood of the Caliph of Damascus came to take in his hands the scepter of the disturbed country and to unite for a while all factions under the standard of the Sultan of Cordoba. This young man was the new ruler whom Charlemagne had so unsuccessfully come to expel, and his name was Abdel Rahman the Omayyad. End of chapter 3
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Young Pretender For 600 years, the greater part of the Mohammedan Empire was nominally under the authority of a central ruler called the Caliph, a title which signifies a successor or substitute. At first, this authority was real and powerful. The Caliph appointed the governors of all the provinces, from Spain to the borders of the Hindu Kushi, and removed any of them at his pleasure. But the empire was too large to hold together round the central pivot for any length of time, and gradually various local governors made themselves virtually independent, although they generally professed the utmost devotion to the Caliph and paid him every honor except obedience. By degrees, even this show of respect was thrown off, and dynasties arose which exposed heretical tenets, repudiated the spiritual supremacy of the Caliph, and denounced him and all his line as usurpers. Finally, the time came when the Caliphs were as weak in temporal authority as the Pope of Rome, and were even kept prisoners in their palace by the mercenary bodyguards they had hired to protect them against their rebellious nobles. This took place about 300 years after the foundation of the Caliphate, and for the second half of their existence, the Caliphs were little more than ciphers to be played with by the great princes of the empire and to contribute a little pomp to their coronations. Finally, the caliphate was abolished in Asia by the Mongol invasion in the 13th century, and though the title is still claimed by the Sultan of Turkey, there is no caliph now in the old comprehensive sense of the word. The earliest province to shake off the authority of the caliph was Andalusia. To understand how this happened, we must remember that the caliphs did not succeed one another in an unbroken line of family inheritance. After the first four or orthodox caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, who were elected more or less by popular vote, the Syrian party set up Moaya as caliph at Damascus, and from him sprang the family of the Omeyyad caliphs, so-called from their ancestor Omeya. There were fourteen Omeyyad caliphs who reigned from 661 to 750 when they were deposed by Esefa, the butcher, who was the first of the second dynasty of caliphs called Abbasid, after their ancestor Abbas, an uncle of the prophet Muhammad. The Abbasid caliphs transferred the seat of government from Damascus to Baghdad and held the caliphate until its destruction by the Mongols in 1258. Among the members of the deposed family of the Umayyad was Abdel Rahman, a name which means servant of the merciful God. Most of his relations were exterminated by the ruthless Abbasid. They were hunted down in all parts of the world and slain without mercy. Abdel Rahman fled like the rest, but with better fortune, for he reached the banks of the Euphrates in safety. One day, as he sat in his tent, watching his little boy playing outside, the child ran to him in affright, and going out to discover the cause, Abdel Rahman saw the village in confusion and the black standard of the Abbasid on the horizon. Hastily seizing up his child, the young prince rushed out of the village and reached the river. Here the enemy almost came up with them and called out that they need no fear, for no injury would be done to them. A young brother who had accompanied him and who was exhausted with swimming turned back and his head was immediately severed from his body. But Abdel Rahman held on till he reached the other side, bearing his child and followed by his servant Bedr. Once more on firm earth, they journeyed night and day till they came to Africa, where the rest of his family joined them, and the sole survivor of the Omayyad princes had leisure to think of his future. He was but twenty years of age, and full of hope and ambition. His mental powers were considerable, and to these he added the advantage of noble stature and great physical energy and courage.
the Arab historians, however, add the unfavorable details that he was blind of one eye and devoid of the sense of smell. In his childhood, wise men had predicted great things of his future, and in spite of the ruin of his family, he was not yet daunted. His first thought turned to Africa, for he clearly perceived that the success of the Abbasid had left him no chance in the East. But after five years of wandering about the Barbary coast, he realized that the Arab governor was not easily to be overturned, and that the already revolted Berbers in the West would not willingly surrender their newly won independence for the empty glory of being ruled by an Umayyad. His glance, therefore, was now directed toward Andalusia, where the various factions in their perpetual strife offered an opening to any clever pretender, and much more to one who could bring such hereditary claims as Abderrahman. He therefore sent his servant Bedr to the chief of the Syrian party in Spain, among whom many were freedmen of the Umayyad, and were thus bound by the Arab code of honor to succor any relations of their former patrons. Bedr found these chiefs willing to receive the young prince, and after some negotiations with the hostile factions, the support of the men from the Yemen was also promised. Upon this, Bedr returned to Africa. Abdel Rahman was saying his prayers on the seashore when he saw the vessel approaching which brought him the good news, and, prone as all Easterners are to draw omens from insignificant circumstances, the name of the first envoy from Andalusia, who was presented to him, Abu Ghalib Temam, which means father of conquest attainment, suggested a happy fate. We shall attain our object, cried the prince, and conquer the land. Without delay, he stepped on board, and they sailed for Spain in September 755. The coming of the survivor of Omeya to Andalusia was like a page of romance, like the arrival of young pretender in Scotland in 1745. The news spread like a conflagration through the land. The old adherent of the royal family hurried to pay him homage. The descendants of Omeyad freedmen put themselves under his orders. Even the Yemen clans, though they could not be expected to feel any peculiar sentiment for the young prince, were sufficiently infected by the zeal of his adherents to keep to their promise and bend together for his support. The governor of Andalusia found himself deserted by most of his troops and forced to wait for a new army, and meanwhile the winter rains made the campaign impossible, and left Abdel Rahman leisure to recruit and organize his forces. In the spring of the following year, the struggle began in earnest. Abdel Rahman was received with enthusiasm at Archdona and Seville, and thence prepared to march on Cordoba. Yusuf, the governor, advanced to resist him, but the Guadalquivir was swollen with rains, and the two armies, on opposite banks, raced with each other who should first arrive at Cordoba. At length, Abdel Rahman, by means of deceitful stratagem, unworthy of a prince of romance, induced Yusuf to let him cross now falling river on the pretext of peace, and once on the other side he fell upon the unsuspecting enemy. Victory declared itself for the prince, and he entered Cordoba in triumph. He had the grace to exert himself to arrest the plundering passion of his troops, and to place the harem or women folk of the ex-governor in safety. Before the year was out, he was master of all the Mohammedan part of Spain, and the dynasty of the Omeyyad of Cordoba, destined to endure for nearly three centuries, was established. The king of Cordoba, however, was not firmly seated without many a struggle. Abdel Rahman had indeed been placed on the throne, but the feat had been accomplished by a small faction out of the numerous parties that divide the land. The new sultan was, however, better able than most princes to hold his own amidst the striving elements of his kingdom. Prompt and decisive in action, troubled by few scruples, by turns terribly severe and perfidiously diplomatic, 
his policy was always equal to an emergency, and there was not a few occasions on which it was put to the test. He had not been long in Andalusia when Ibn Mugit sailed from Africa to set up the black standard of Abbasid in Spain. He landed in the province of Beja and soon found supporters among the disaffected, always ready to join in some new thing. Abderrahman was besieged for two months in Carmona. The situation was perilous in the extreme, for every day gave the enemy more opportunity of increasing their forces. Abdel Rahman, ever full of resource, hearing that the enemy had somewhat relaxed their precautions, gathered together seven hundred of his bravest followers, kindled a great fire, and saying that it was now a question of death or victory, flung his scabbard into the flames. The seven hundred followed his example in token of their resolution never to sheathe their sword again till they were free, and sailing out after their leader, fell upon the besiegers tooth and nail. The Abbasid invasion was utterly annihilated. Abdel Rahman, with the ferocity that occasionally disfigured him, put their leader's head in a bag with the descriptive labels attached to their ears and confided the precious parcel to a pilgrim bound for Mecca, by whom it was put into the hands of the Abbasid caliph Mansur himself. When the caliph had seen the contents of the bag, he was very wroth, but he could not help exclaiming, Thank God, there is a sea between that man and me. While cordially detesting the successful sultan of Cordova, his abbasid foe was forced to render homage to his skill and courage. He called Abdel Rahman the hawk of the Quraysh, the falcon of the prophet's own tribe. Wonderful, he would exclaim, is daring wisdom prudence he had shown to enter the path of destruction throw himself into a distant land hard to approach and well defended there to profit by the jealousies of the rival parties to make them turn their arms against one another instead of against himself to win the homage and obedience of his subject and having overcome every difficulty to rule supreme lord of all over truth, no man before him has done this. The defeat of the Abbasid invasion was followed by other successes on the part of the new sultan. He induced the people of Toledo, who had long held out against him, to consent to peace and deliver up their chiefs, and the leaders were grossly humiliated and crucified. The chief of the Yemenite faction proving dangerous, Abdel Rahman gave him a safe conduct and thus enticed him into his palace, where he tried to stab him with his own hand, but finding the Arab too vigorous, called in the guard and had him assassinated. Almost immediately, a great revolt of Berbers of the northern borders occurred. Ten years were occupied in reducing them to obedience, and meanwhile the Yemenites, burning with vengeance for the murder of their chief, took advantage of the sultan's absence in the north to rise. They had not yet realized the energy or the astuteness of the men. He had already set the revolted Berbers by the ears by playing upon their petty jealousies, and he now exerted his diplomacy to breed discord among the Yemenites. He tempered with the Berbers who formed a large part of their army, so that they deserted in the midst of the fray, and Abdel Rahman soldiers fell upon the flying multitude until thirty thousand bodies lay on the field. The huge grave long remained the sight to be seen by the curious. Then followed that formidable coalition between three disaffected Arab chiefs and Charlemagne, which was so near destroying the fabric that Abdel Rahman had painfully built up, but collapsed before Zaragoza at at Lonses bias without a single blow from the very person they had assembled to destroy. Henceforth the Sultan was allowed to enjoy in comparative peace the fruits of his victories. He had subdued all the hostile elements in Spain to his iron will. He had cast down the proud Arab chiefs who had dared to measure sword with him. He had massacred or assassinated the leaders of rebellion and had proved himself master of the position. 
but tyranny, cruel and perfidious as he is, brings its own punishment. The tyrant may force the submission, but he cannot compel the devotion of his people, and the empire that is won by sword must be sustained by the same weapon. Honest men refuse to enter into the service of a lord who could betray and slay as did this sultan, his old supporters, those who had first welcomed him to Spain, now turned coldly away when they saw the tyrant in his naked cruelty. His own relations, who had flocked over to his court as an asylum from the Abbasid, found his despotism so intolerable that they plotted again and again to depose him, with the inevitable result of losing their heads. Abdel Rahman was left in mournful solitude. His old friends had deserted him. His enemies, though helpless, cursed him nonetheless. His very kinsmen and servants turned against him. It was partly that the long war with faction had spoilt the fine nature, partly that the character was relentless. No longer could he mingle as before in the crowds that thronged the street of Cordova. Suspicious of every one, wrapped in gloomy thought and distracted by bloody memories, he rode through the streets surrounded by a strong guard of foreigners. Forty thousand Africans, whose devotion to their paymaster was equaled by their hatred of the whole population whom they repressed, formed the sultan's protection against the people whom he ground under his heel. In his desolation he wrote a poem on a palm which he transplanted from the land of his ancestors. For like most Andalusian Arabs, he was something of a poet, in which he compassionated the tree for its exile. Like me, though art separate from relations and friends, though didst grow in a different soil, and now thou art far from the land of thy birth. He had accomplished the object which he had set before himself in the days of his young ambition, when he came a stranger and alone to subdue a kingdom. He had brought the Arabs and Berbers into subjection, and restored order and peace in the land, but he had done it all at the expense of his subjects' hearts. The handsome youth who had come like a young chevalier to win the homage and devotion of the Spanish Arabs, after thirty-two years went down to his grave a detested tyrant, upheld in his blood-stained throne only by the sword of mercenaries, whose loyalty was purchased by gold. He had inaugurated the sway of sword in Spain, and his successors would have to maintain the principle. As the great historian of the Moors has observed, it is not easy to see by what other means the turbulent factions of Arabs and Berbers were to be kept in order, or how anarchy was to be averted without severe measures of repression. Neither of these races was accustomed to monarchy. Nevertheless, a tyranny so sustained formed a melancholy spectacle, despite all the glories and triumphs that illumined it. An ancient Arab historian, Ibn Hayyan, gives the following portrait of the first sultan of Cordoba. Abdel Rahman was kind-hearted and well disposed to mercy. He was eloquent in his speech and endowed with a quick perception. He was very slow in his determinations, but constant and persevering in carrying them into effect. He was active and stirring. He would never lie in repose and abandon himself to indulgence. He never entrusted affairs of government to anyone, but administered them himself. Yet he never failed to consult, in case of difficulty, the men of wisdom and experience. He was a brave and intrepid warrior, always the first in the battlefield, terrible in his anger and intolerant of opposition. His countenance inspired awe in those who approached him, friends and foes alike. He was wont to follow beers and pray over the dead, and in the mosque on Fridays he would often enter the pulpit and address the people. He visited the sick and mixed with the people in their rejoicings. This is doubtless the young Abdul Rahman, before opposition and conspiracy had made him suspicious and cruel. 
power has often a terrible manner of punishing its possessors. The usual question that is asked when a despot dies is, who will succeed him, and the common answer is revolution and anarchy. A throne that is set upon steel edges does not readily pass from father to son. Yet the dynasty of Abderrahman did not collapse with the death of his despotic founder. It was to be expected that the many hostile forces which he had with difficulty restrained when released by his death would have sprung into redoubled activity. Such, however, was not the case. Partly because he had too thoroughly terrified the people for them easily to recover their courage, and partly because in his successor they recognized the very antithesis of his father, a prince to be loved and honored, the people remained quiet for some years. Hisham, who in 788 succeeded his father at the age of 30, was a model of all the virtues, and as if to make sure that he should practice them with assiduity during his brief reign, an astrologer predicted that he had but eight years to live. The sultan naturally devoted his short space to preparing for the next world. In his youth, his palace had been filled with men of science, poets and sages, and the boy was father of the men. His acts of piety was numberless, and in him the indigent and persecuted had a sure refuge. He would send trust emissaries into all parts of his dominions to seek out wrongdoings and repress it, and to further the cause of righteousness. He had the streets patrolled at night to prevent riotous and vicious conduct, and the fines they levied on the evildoers were distributed among those good souls whom rain and cold could not deter from attending the mosques at night time. The sultan himself visits the sick, would often go forth on stormy nights to carry food to some pious invalid and to watch beside his bedside. With all this he was no patron. He would lead his armies against the Christians of the north. Like the thoroughbred Arab he was, and though the people affectionately dubbed him the amiable and the just, he could show sufficient firmness when his reign was menaced by the conspiracies of his uncles. He increased the number of his Mamluks, or bodyguard, and a thousand of them were always on duty day and night on both sides of the river to protect his palace. He was a huntsman, yet so scrupulous was he that when he rebuilt the bridge of Cordoba, which still stands to this day, hearing that his subject murmured that he only built this great work to make his hunting parties more convenient, he vowed he would never cross it again, and he never did. Before the eight years had quite expired, this exemplary prince was gathered to his well on the paradise, and then it became apparent that his very goodness had but served to stir up a new factor of rebellion in the states. This new danger was the power of Mohammedan priest. The term is hardly an accurate one, for in Islam there is no priesthood in the strict sense of Catholic Christianity. The men who recite the prayers and preach the weekly sermons in the mosques are laymen taken from their shops or other occupations, and appointed for the time to lead the congregations. There is no distinction between laic and cleric in Islam. Nevertheless, there is something which tallies more or less with what we mean by a priesthood. There is always in Mohammedan countries a body of men whose lives are specially devoted to religion. They may be dervishes with peculiar rights, or they may be merely theological students, pupils of some renowned teacher, whose doctrine fills them with unwanted zeal and enthusiasm. They may be reciters of the Quran, or schoolmasters. Such a body is found throughout the Muslim world, and it has to be reckoned with in every Mohammedan country. The students of the Azhar Mosque at Cairo, the Softas of Constantinople, the Mullahs of many an eastern city, have shown what the force of fanaticism can avail in times of excitement. In Andalusia, this power was now about to be displayed. The first rebellion after Abderrahman's death came from the least expected quarter. 
not from the Christians, nor from any special political party of Arabs or of Berbers, but from the devout sons of Islam, the theological students of Cordoba. These students were largely composed of renegades, or the sons of renegades. It has already been seen that the Spaniards cheerfully adopted Islam, and like most converts, became more Muslim than the Muslims themselves. Abd rahman was far too wise and far too worldly to permit the theologians, especially those of Spanish blood, any preponderating influence in his kingdom. But the pious Hisham neither saw the danger, nor had he perceived it, would have regarded it as a danger at all. He loved to place his confidence in holy men, whose conduct was dictated by the strict observance of their religion, and in whom he failed to detect the germs of common worldly ambition and love of power. It happened, too, that at this time the theologians were headed by a singularly gifted and active mind, a favored pupil of one of the lights of the holy city, Medina, where the Arabian prophet was buried, and a man whose soul was devoured by that mixture of religious fervor and political ambition which has so often made havoc of nations. This doctor, Yahya, profited by the devotion and piety of Hisham to raise the theologians of Cordoba to a height of influence and power that might have made his shrewd father, Abd rahman turn in his grave. So long, indeed, as they had their own way, all went well. But in 796, when the good Hisham departed in the order of sanctity, a complete change came over the court. The new sultan, Hakam, was not indifferent to religion or in any way a reprobate, but he was gay and sociable, and enjoyed life as it came to him, without the slightest leaning toward asceticism. Such a character was wholly objectionable to the bigoted doctors of theology. They spoke of the sultan with pious horror, publicly prayed for his conversion, and even reviled and insulted him to his face. Finding him incurable in his levity, they plotted to set up another member of his family on the throne. The conspirators failed, and many of the leading nobles who had joined in the plot, together with the number of fanatical doctors, were crucified. Undeterred by this in 806, the people, stirred up by the bigots, rose again only to be as summarily repressed as before. Even the terrible fate of the nobles of Toledo, who had rebelled as was their wont, and were at this time treacherously inveigled in the hands of the crown priests and massacred to a man, did not deter the Cordovans from another revolt. For seven years, indeed, the memory of the days of the fourth as the massacre at Toledo was called, kept the fanatics of Cordoba within bounds, but as the recollection of that fearful hole into which the murdered bodies of all the nobility of Toledo had been cast grew fainter, there were symptoms of a fresh insurrection at the capital. Popular feeling ran very high, not only against the sultan, because he would not wear sackcloth or ashes or pretend to be an ascetic, but still more against his large bodyguard of mutes, so-called because, being negroes and the like, they could not speak Arabic. The mutes dared not venture in the street of Cordoba except in numbers. A single soldier was sure to be mobbed and might be murdered. One day a wanton blow struck by a member of the guard roused the whole people. They rushed with one accord to the palace, led by thousands of the theological students, who inhabited the southern suburb of the city and seemed bent on carrying it by assault in spite of its fortification and garrison. The Sultan Hakam looked forth over the sea of the faces and watched with consternation the devoted mob repulsing the charge of his tried cavalry, but even in this hour of desperate peril he did not lose the sang Freud which is the birthright of great men. Retiring to his hall, he told his page Hyacinth to bring him a bottle of civet, with which he proceeded calmly to perfume his hair and beard. The page could not repress his astonishment at such an occupation, when the cruel mob was even then battering at the gates. But Hakam, 
who was fully aware of his danger, replied, Silence, rascal! How do you suppose the rebels would be able to find out my head among the rest if it were not distinguished by its sweet odor? He then summoned his officers and took his measures for the defense. These were simple enough, but they proved effectual. He dispatched his cousin with the force of cavalry by a roundabout way to the southern suburb, which he set in flames, and when the people turned back in terror from the besieged palace to rescue their wives and children from their burning homes, Hakam and the rest of the garrison fell on them in the rear. Attacked on both hands, the unfortunate rebels were cut to pieces, the grim mutes rode through them, slashing them down by the hundred, and disregarding, if they understood, their prayers for mercy. Hakam's maneuver saved the palace and the dynasty, and the insurrection was converted into a wholesale massacre. Yet, in the moment of his triumph, the sultan stayed his hand. He did not press his victory to the last limits, but was content with ordering the destruction of the rebellious suburb and the exiles of its inhabitants, who were forced to fly some to Alexandria to the number of 15,000 besides women and children, whence they eventually crossed to Crete, others 8,000 in all to Fez in Africa. The majority of the exiles were descendants of the old Spanish population, who had embraced Islam, but were glad of a pretext to assert their racial antipathy for the Arab rule. The chief offenders, the Fakis or theological students, however, was left unpunished, partly, no doubt, because many of them were Arabs, and partly in deference to their profession of orthodoxy. To one of their leaders, who was dragged before Hakam, and who told the sultan, in the heat of his fanatical rage, that in hating his king he was obeying the voice of God, Hakam made the memorable reply, he who commands thee, as thou dost pretend, to hate me, commands me to pardon thee. Go and live in God's protection. End of chapter 4